The, t- the name of the session is Overhauling Women's Health Care. For those of us that have heard the news, we understand why evermore this topic is super important. At the Commonwealth Fund, over 100 years, we've invested in a lot of policy research and we've advocated for improvement of women's health care, not just in the delivery of care, but also in improving research into women's health care. So at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the moderator of today's session, um, Kate Snow, who is an anchor of NBC Nightly News. Um, she's also a senior national correspondent with the NBC. So I hand it over to you, Kate. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Round of applause. Good morning. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. So yes, as referenced, um, I don't know if everyone in the room is aware of it, but there was a decision by the Supreme Court this morning um, which essentially overturns Roe versus Wade, which is obviously a huge story uh, for Maria and I who cover the news, a huge story for women's health. So I do want to start there, but let me introduce the panel before I get ahead of myself. Um, to my left is Dr. Barry Ridgway. She is chief of staff at the Cleveland Clinic right now, and previously she was institute chair of the Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Women's Health Institute. She was also the inaugural academic chair for the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine, Department of Obst- Obst- <laughs> Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Biology. Um, and lots more, but you have it in your books, so I'm just gonna give the brief versions. Um, To her left is Maria Shriver, who is, of course, the founder of the Women's Alzheimer's Movement and the strategic partner for women's health and Alzheimer's at the Cleveland Clinic. They're working together now. She founded Shriver Media. She writes a weekly uh, digital newsletter, which I love, and if you don't subscribe, you should. It's it's like a breath of fresh air every Sunday. It's called The Sunday Paper. She's an award-winning journalist and I'm not biased. She works with me at NBC News and is a special anchor for NBC. And then uh, on the far side, we have President Paula Johnson, also Dr. Paula Johnson, who is the president of Wellesley College and has been since 2016, putting STEM at the forefront at that college. Uh, She's also a physician scientist, and she was one of the first researchers in her field to identify the need for consideration of sex differences in in medical treatment um, and in research. And she also was professor at Harvard Medical School and the Harvard School of Public Health. She founded the Connor Center for Women's Health and Gender Biology. So you've got a lot of experience on this stage. Let's just welcome everyone. Dr. Ridgway, because you are in the field of OBGYN, um, I'm going to start with you on today's news. Um, I don't want to get political up here. I don't think any of us are here to do that. But we're here to talk about women's health, and this is going to have an enormous impact on women's health across the country. Walk us through what you see as the really practical consequence of, of the Supreme Court's ruling. Uh, Yeah, thank you, Um, and so happy to be here. Um, Today is a really difficult day for women's health. Um, To level set, let's be clear, one in four women in America get an abortion. And I'm not talking about a miscarriage or management of miscarriage, but I'm talking about elective termination of pregnancy. So if it doesn't affect you personally, it certainly affects someone that you know and someone that you love. There will be um, enormous consequences. Um, We know from other areas, when we restrict abortion, abortions don't stop, but what actually do stop are safe abortions. And we know from Romania, from Poland, when we restrict abortion, we actually see an increase in death in women overall and an increase in um, their levels of illness related to pregnancy. We've already seen that here in the US with a, um, a looking at different states that either are very restrictive on abortion access, are moderate or more permissive and supportive of those rights. And um, we see quite a difference in outcome and also in those that are more restrictive for abortion, there are higher rates of maternal morbidity and mortality. Yeah, you were telling me, we were talking outside, you said because of the restrictions in some states, you have scientific research that shows that women will go forward with a pregnancy and maybe have a 
a detrimental outcome. Correct, yeah. correct. You're in Ohio. Yes. Um, Ohio does not have a so-called trigger law, but the governor of Ohio um, has made it clear that he will follow the Supreme Court ruling with some legislation in Ohio. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder what your perspective is on the states that are going to be starting to make changes now, some of them triggered today. Will women end up traveling hundreds of miles if they feel they want an abortion? What, what do you see happening? Mm -hmm. It's a great question, and it really depends on your resources. Women who come from families uh, who have resources are able to afford traveling. Those will travel um, for an abortion or pregnancy termination. Women who have fewer resources will not be able to. They won't be able to afford time off of work, the gas, as well as just the coordination of services across state lines. Dr. Johnson, if I could go to you, President Johnson, just for a second, um, and Maria, I'll come to you in, in a minute. Um, I'm curious about the impact this might have on the medical field, because in some of these states, the legislation is actually very clearly saying that people can sue, they can file lawsuits against providers. I assume that liability insurance, especially for, for those in gynecology, will go, you know, those, those costs will go up for doctors. Do you, do you worry that there might be, or do you think there might be an impact on women going into the field of gynecology. Yeah. Well, I think that for, you know, we also, again, just based on the data, we know that there is already a shortage of uh, physicians who do provide the service of abortion. And we've seen those numbers decrease over time. So we're starting at a place where there's a shortage, and I would say, some of that is due to some of the legal barriers, some of the threats, but there have been threats to physicians' lives. And um, I would suspect that based on history and based on what we've seen, that we will continue to see um, young people, whether they're women or men, going into the field of OBGYN, uh, choose not to have their own lives threatened no matter what, and the lives of their, their loved ones, no matter what their personal, you know, um, beliefs are and, and desires might be. Maria, I was going to start originally with you <laughs> and talk about a survey um, that is being released here at Aspen this morning um, of 1,000 women. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to go straight there or you want to say anything about today's decision, but I, I, I also want you to give us the headlines of this new survey that's coming out today. Yeah, well, I, I would love to talk about that, but I would like to kind of set the stage. I, I know you said we don't want to get political here, but I think we have to get political here. Um, I think that this is a devastating day in women's history, in women's right to choose, in women's human rights. I think this is unparalleled. It's a moment where everybody has to stand up, speak up, and let their position be known. I think it is a, it's gonna be a day that we will look back on as a game-changing day. Game-changing in our politics, game-changing in gender policy, game-changing for women of all ages. And um, when I heard this news this morning, I was talking to Dr. Ridgway, I sat in my hotel room and I could feel I was stunned. I felt disbelief. I felt rage. I felt fear. And look, I'm not having a kid. So it's not gonna be about my choice, but I have two daughters, I have two grandchildren, I have two sons, and I care about the trajectory of men and women's lives. And this is something that we all need to care about because this tells us the kind of country we live in and what this country cares about. I think fundamentally, that's what I think we're dealing with. So I think those of us who've worked in women's health and journalism, the survey that we wanted to talk about today talks about women's health holistically. And I, as the founder of the Women's Alzheimer's Movement, have been trying to push the conversation about women's health beyond reproductive mm -hmm. rights. Because, you know, you spend part of your life trying not to get pregnant, then a part of your life trying <laughs> to get pregnant, and then you have this whole period of your life 
where, you know, you can get osteoporosis, you can get autoimmune diseases, you're perimenopausal, you're menopausal, you have this whole trajectory. You have mental health issues, uh, depression issues, anxiety issues, and that's what uh, women don't know about. They're not talking to their providers. And when we did this poll, it was stunning to me. Not only did 80-some percent of women not know they were at increased risk for getting Alzheimer's, two-thirds of those who have Alzheimer's are women. An overwhelming majority of women were caregivers for children and aging parents. And when you look at the number between 35 and 55, that number skyrockets to into the 60 percent. A majority of women had not spoken to their health care providers about perimenopause or menopause. They did not know that depression and anxiety were symptoms of menopause. They did, had not spoken to their doctors about mental health. And so there is so much to talk about when it comes to women's health, when it comes to women's health research. We're decades behind when it comes to research. And I know uh, both of these doctors yeah. will talk about that. But this day sets us back. It sets us back in every way. So we can have this discussion today about the broadness of women's health and the need for research. But make mo no mistake, we can't talk about women's health if we're not seen, if we're not cared for, if we're not protected by this country. And you said your concern is that the news, the, you know, the political climate that we're in yeah. creates this sort of everyone's going to be focused on abortion, 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 right? And which, which goes against everything you just said. You don't well, want to only yeah, it's be it's really about hard to talk, reproductive health. Talk about women's health holistically. It's really hard to talk about the need for research into women's health. It's hard to talk about hormones and menopause and perimenopause and autoimmune diseases and research and sparing it out in sex differences and getting women to be involved in clinical trials. Uh, women, especially black and brown women, it, about health equity. All these things are women's health. And then we just get divided on this issue about who's pro-choice, who's pro-life, and why you can't be pro-life and pro-choice and all of this. And it sets us back and prevents us from having a holistic conversation. Yeah. My entire email I just checked about a half hour ago, almost every single email in my inbox, my professional NBC inbox, is statements on both sides, diametrically opposed. I mean, you can see what's already happening you know, as we sit here. Yeah. Um, I do want to talk about some of the other issues, yeah. though, if we can, because I think they are so important. Um, you all. Everyone up here studies how men and women are different when it comes to health. Mm -hmm. President Johnson, I, I want to put it to you. How pervasive are those differences when you look at actual ailments and illnesses and different diseases? So, you know, women um, and men are genetically different. And so every cell, and this came out in a big report back in 2002, um, where every cell has a sex. And what that means is that those basic genetic differences combined with the hormonal differences really produce differences in health and disease across organ systems. So whether it's your brain and Alzheimer's, whether it's your heart, I'm a cardiologist, your lungs, autoimmune diseases, you name it, there are pervasive sex differences. And we still, we've done better in understanding what those are. It was 1993 when the NIH Revitalization Act was passed that mandated that the NIH included women in phase three clinical trials, but it was only until 2016, and we, we worked very hard on this. 2016, only a few years ago, that the NIH required that sex be a biologic variable and that data actually be stratified, reported by sex, reported by sex, race, ethnicity categories. So, you know, there is um, there's evidence, and we can go through various examples, but this is critical in terms of understanding the health and well-being of women. And then really wrapping around that, what are the social and environmental factors that are different in women's lives that also impact their biology. And when you get the two and get that, that full picture, that is when we'll fully understand the health and, and well-being of, of women. And I do just want to add, I'm here, we are here talking about women. We do want to recognize that we are talking here about men and women. There's a binary gender is broad 
And this is not to say that there does not need to be more research on issues of transgender people, gender, research on gender fluidity. That is all true. But I think here, fundamentally, we're, we're talking about women. For simplicity, we're talking men right. and women on this panel. But you make a very good point that that is certainly not the whole universe. Um, Dr. Widgeway, you're partnering now. You, Cleveland Clinic partnered with Women's Alzheimer's, yep. Alzheimer's Movement to do a clinic in Las Vegas for right. years. But now you've broadened the partnership. Can you talk about, Dr. Ridgway, what the partnership looks like? And you were, you were telling me on the phone about, and it plays into everything that's been said, the holistic approach, the approach of not just treating women at stages of childbirth and, and you know, that, looking at it through that lens. Absolutely. Uh, this is a wonderful partnership, and it's focusing on prevention. Um, it gets into deeper real care of women and not just having the care provided in a fragmented fashion, which is currently um, how it is in most places. Um, divided between, my life. <laughs> yes. The, who's providing your reproductive care um, and then often staying with that doctor whose expertise may not be in prevention and in care of the whole woman, including chronic diseases. So what um, we have been talking about is, of course, continuing our work with Alzheimer's prevention um, across our enterprise at Cleveland Clinic in educating, in researching. That's critical. Again, we're behind in researching um, and in providing that um, important <coughs> clinical care. But taking it a step further for women's health and how, uh, as a coordinated system, we can value the entire woman's life and also connect the dots, things that have happened early in life, things that are in pregnancy, diabetes, high blood pressure, that predict outcomes later in life, and really intervening to reduce those risks. But to do that, Maria, you have to have doctors talking to each other, yeah. right? Yeah, well, that's the goal, yeah. right? To have a coordinated approach, to have a holistic vision uh, once again, for women who are in their 40s, their 50s, their 60s, to be able to have a dialogue that expands beyond 15 minutes uh, with their doctor, to uh, have options put on the table for them. So when they come in and they're in their 40s or 50s and they're talking about depression and menopause, and in this, in this uh, survey, you see how many women say that they're on medication for depression, for anxiety. And those are also symptoms of menopause. So for some of those women, a conversation should be about hormones, if they're eligible for hormones, should be about other ways of dealing with uh, depression and anxiety. But we haven't had, and as I think both of the doctors were saying, you know, women's health is decades behind, not only in terms of research. So if you're a woman my age and you go to have a conversation about hormones and menopause, the doctor will say, we don't have the research. We just can't tell you how long you should be on hormones, if you should be on hormones. We don't really know. There's a lot of we don't really know. And I think my goal certainly is, and I know there is, is for younger women coming up that they won't get the we don't know, that they will have a different healthcare experience so that they won't feel unheard, unseen, gaslit, that they will be able to get research data when they go in to ask about autoimmune disease, when they ask about why are so many women diagnosed with MS? Why are women, two thirds of those with Alzheimer's? That's how I got into this because my dad was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and I started going around researching and more and more women my age were saying, gosh, I'm taking care of my mother with Alzheimer's. My mother and I kept saying to people, isn't this kind of disproportionately impacting women? And everybody's like, no, it's just because women live longer. That's not true. That is not true. So women are disproportionately impacted by Alzheimer's, and if Alzheimer's is in your brain for 20-some years, what's happening to women in their 40s and their 50s that makes them symptomatic in their 70s? Huh. Perimenopause. Menopause. Loss of estrogen. Could be an indicator. You're funding, funding research. research on that, yeah, right? On exactly. the loss of estrogen. Is there yeah. any... I don't know if this is a doctor question or a Maria question, but is there any... Uh, concrete proof yet of lack of estrogen or estrogen falling actually contributing to Alzheimer's or do we just not know yet? Yeah. So, the, I mean, the, I'm not, I am not a neurologist, 
Uh, but I will say that we do know that some of when, when data, we, so we did some of this research at Brigham and Women's at the Connor Center, along with uh, a brilliant um, neuroscientist, Risa Sperling, we know that some of the earliest symptoms do happen really at that time of menopause, perimenopause, so that we begin to see a change, and the biggest change there is the drop off in estrogen. Mm -hmm. The question is, how do we better define what those changes mean? What are the triggers for those changes? We've not really been successful in understanding the connection between those changes and some of the genetic mutations that have been identified. And this is the work. There's a lot of research going on. This is the work that needs to be done in terms of really intersecting the advanced methods we have today of really doing science, but really connecting that with looking at women more specifically. Right, but we do know that if we look at the brains of women going through perimenopause to menopause, the brain does change. The brain is changing. And just getting women in particular to think of menopause and perimenopause as a brain change, not just a physical change, but that's your brain changing. So initiate that conversation with your healthcare provider. I feel when people talk about brain fog, that's a real thing, right? Yeah. So when people talk about irritability, anxiety, it's not a joke. It's a real thing that's changing in your physical body. So my hope is that this survey uh, and this conversation that's happening now in hospitals all across this country will raise the level of women's health, will raise and change the conversation that women are having. And by the way, I see a lot of men here, so I'm also very hopeful about that because I have four brothers, and as I say, they're like, what's going on with women who are in their 40s and 50s? Help me, I wanna understand. And so it's kind of joked about a lot, but I think kind of understanding the changes that we all go through, and obviously men go through hormonal changes as well, but broadening this conversation is key mm -hmm. to our emotional health, our physical, our cognitive, our spiritual health. Can I just add one thing? Because I think that that is absolutely right. Two quick points. Good science, which is looked at by sex, is good for both men and women. Yeah. Averages are not good for anybody. Mm -hmm. So I think this isn't this, of course, is a women's health issue, but it's not good for anyone when we report averages and talk in, in generalizations. Right, uh, if, we so look at, will, if we look at heart disease, for yeah, example, absolutely, as absolutely. And, and we have so many examples in cardiovascular disease of that. The other thing I would say that's really important in this area is to also think about other factors like race and ethnicity. So we know that blacks are far more likely to actually suffer with Alzheimer's. And those numbers for women, black women, if you think about the two, are quite high. And we don't know why. Why is that happening? Because race is not a genetic construct. So there is a tremendous amount of work to go on. And here we're talking about health disparities in populations that frequently don't even have access to the best care. Um, so lots of work and ways to think about this. Yeah, you were, you were talking to me about the intersection between sex, female, or, you know, being a woman, but also all the differences that we have. We can't just look at women as one monolith, right? right? We've got to look at all the diversity of women in research, yeah, too. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I want to get back to you, sorry. Um, there's so much to talk about. You said to me, something that stuck with me, you said, you're an OBGYN. Mm -hmm. OBGYNs in training are not trained in general, like general medicine. practitioner medicine. And your GP is not trained in OBGYN. I had never just, I had never thought about that. Of course not. But why am I saying of course not? Like, shouldn't there be more crossover so that, because I, I think about how we're siloed, right? And we go, I mean, for me, I'm sure every, probably most women in this room, it's like I have, I have an OBGYN, but I also have a GP, and I also have someone who's dealing with hamstring problems I have in my legs, you know, and they're all in different, in New York, they're all for, work for different places with different um, portals, right? Yep. <laughs> different communication. So 
how do you fix some of that in training? Can you? Can you can you start in medical school to make sure that doctors at least know each other's subjects? I think it's a great question and it's a really tricky topic. When we look at the rate at which medical knowledge is doubling, it is becoming exponential. You know, in 2010 we said it was a decade mm. and now we're saying it's about two months. And so when you think of um, you want your doctor to be um, keeping up with the literature, understanding, knowing these studies, it's probably not realistic to do a training period, uh, say, in obstetrics or gynecology, and then keep up in internal right. medicine, in OB, in gynecology, in everything. So that what's it, more realistic then? It is coordinated care between different providers. Um, that is how you can really achieve that best care in that when you have someone who um, you have a reproductive or a bleeding concern, you see an OBGYN. When you need a quarterback that's coordinating your care between these different entities, that person's really critical and that's who will be your partner in really promoting, preventing, and advancing your, your health. I have a 16-year-old daughter. Oh, do you want to jump in? Yeah, because I think this is a really important issue and I'll give you, I just want to give a concrete example of where we can make a difference here. So um, I think Dr. Ridgway is absolutely right. So if we look at the disorders that can happen during pregnancy, you already mentioned hypertension, high blood pressure, diabetes, preeclampsia. What we know today, and, and this was really a, a big step forward, because when I started practicing cardiology, we did not look at those disorders that happen during pregnancy as risk factors for cardiovascular disease in adults, in adult women. And what we know today, for example, for preeclampsia, it's not only a risk for the woman, but it's a risk for her offspring. That has now been codified in a set of guidelines. And at my former organization at Brigham and Women's, what we did was we really had a service where when women had those disorders during pregnancy, it was coordinated with primary care so that the ongoing attention to those issues, not just during the pregnancy itself, but during the lifespan of that woman. It was educating her regarding what she needed to be thinking about in terms of those risks, but also coordinating the care. And I think if we think more holistically about those areas where we have knowledge, we can really do a tremendous service. I'd like to just pick up on that because we talk about you know, doctors ha having a quarterback as a doctor and connecting all these different um, diseases or situations that may be happening in your teenage years or in pregnancy, et cetera, you yourself have to be the quarterback. I mean, I, I, I just want to really yeah. reiterate that because as somebody who was a caregiver for a father with Alzheimer's and a mother who had strokes, it was a full-time job. I have four brothers and they were like, you do it. Uh, they, <laughs> and women are overwhelmingly caregiving in this country today, unpaid caregiving while also raising children and holding down full-time jobs and sometimes more, that to be a quarterback on your health, your parents' health, this is a mm -hmm. huge thing, understanding what medications they're on, having a notebook, going in as a, and seeing yourself as the quarterback, the advocate, not just for yourself, but, and since this poll said, so many women see themselves as caregivers and see themselves as having to put someone else's care ahead of their own. You need a notebook, you need a binder, you need to write down all the medications. I used to find doctors prescribing medications to my mother that didn't go together. Yeah. That they had no idea what the other doctors had prescribed for my mother. I've got my parents keeping Google Docs. I don't know if this is the most secure way to do it. Probably not. But I, but I do. I have them like yeah. with all their medications, so that my siblings and I can see. God forbid, yeah. if there's a, they're, they're healthy. But like when there's a problem, right? I can say, wait a second. Yeah, that it, makes a lot of sense. I also am having the thought, Maria. Why do we have to be the quarterback? Why can't there be some? Right? <laughs> Why can't there be some magic doctor who is our central person? Well, I think if we leave yeah. things up to other people, we get into the situation that we're in today. Yeah. Right? So I think, um, you know, I think certainly my generation came along and thought doctor knows best. 
Um, and I, these are two very talented doctors, and you know, there's a lot on doctors' plates, and then we can get into the whole billing system and the mm -hmm. fact that they only have 15 minutes right. to talk it's to us. It's sort of structural, isn't so it? So it's like structural, it's is. billing, it's who's got insurance, who doesn't. The other thing that I think is really important to know is that certainly for when it comes to women, women who are baby boomers, you know, 60 and above, late 50s, and they're on public insurance, right? There's, it's really expensive to grow old in this country. And we have millions of people growing old, and who's going to take care of them? Yeah. And how is this all going to work? Which is why I try to talk about lifestyle when it comes to uh, Alzheimer's. When I got into the Alzheimer's space, it was all about plaques and tangles. And so when we talk about black and brown women, when we talk about women, we have to include discussion of stress. How do women manifest stress? We have to talk about sleep. We have to talk about food. We have to talk about movement. All of these things that we know impact the brain. And we just have to talk about the brain. I always say that if women focused as much on their brain as we did on our lips, our thighs, and our eyes, we'd have a, <laughs> we'd be like focused on this. But this is a new space, right? So I think it's important for those of us who are worried about our brains, and we all should be. It's not just people who have Alzheimer's that run yeah. in their family, because everybody is susceptible to neurological disease, which is why we launched this huge, massive brain study at the Cleveland Clinic is to try to understand where that silent period is. In cardiovascular and heart health, you can go in and if you're in danger, they can give you a statin or they can talk to you about your heart health. We don't know when you're in danger when it comes to Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. We don't know the silent period, which is why the brain study, uh, looking at people kind of 50 and beyond to try to see where does the brain begin to change? Where do you start to get in trouble, which will give doctors a new insight into how to treat people as neurological changes begin? I started to say before, because I wanted to just flip it for a second, you're talking about mostly about seniors and older women. I have a 16-year-old daughter, right? And looking ahead, you know, how can she, Dr. Bridgeway, mm -hmm maybe do better than I have done at managing her own health and being her own quarterback. What advice would you give to young people who have a whole lifetime ahead of them, young women, on how to manage things? Availability of evidence-based um, guidelines, knowledge is so critical. And with social media, with the internet, that's not always the case. There's plenty of information out there but to really hone in on what's valuable, what can really guide her. And I think a thing in that 16 age, we are a little bit afraid sometimes to empower them. It is the time to empower them. It's the time to say, this is your health. This is your life. Things you do now, choices you make now are gonna have consequences. And that to continue to live that and to understand that checking in and prioritizing our own health is of utmost importance. And all three of you have said to me, ask <laughs> questions. Mm -hmm. I know, Dr. Johnson, you said it is critical that women, when they're faced with any diagnosis, <laughs> say, what was your question? It was like, I think what, what, what you, is... You, you do need to ask, are there differences for men and women in this disorder? Or if you're having a screening exam, you can ask. Are there different risk factors for women that I should be aware of? I mean, I think there are ways to trigger the discussion that doesn't put the onus on you to have the knowledge because that isn't really fair. I mean, and, and I would just look at this room. There's a lot of power in this room. I bet there are people in this room who are on hospital boards. I bet there are people in this room who are investors in biotech or who support other research organizations. I think we there have to- There might be some donors in this room. <laughs> <laughs> and donors. I think that we have to understand what it is that we can do to really make a sea change because this issue of health equity, inclusive of sex and gender, race, ethnicity, and equity, is only gonna really change is if there's a movement, and that movement really does have to start with us. Because it can feel too overwhelming when you think about all of these different pieces that need to happen. But if you think about your own life and what you are engaged in, there are probably questions that you can ask, areas that you can push 
that can be extremely beneficial. And another place to really push is on medication. So yeah. certain yeah, doses of medication, most of the medication you are given has been tested on a man and a white man at that. And, you know, I've often found like I'll get the same medication as my six foot three, you know, 24 year old son. And I'm like, wait, what? So I think it's really important to ask about dosage and medication. Is this a dosage for a guy who's six foot one and 200? Or has this been tested on a woman? Right. These are really and I mean, stunning when you ask these yeah. questions. And also, I think as young women to think about when we come back to kind of birth control, what is the ramification of being on birth control for 15 years on the brain? What, is, what are the studies for that? How long should you be on birth control? How long should women be on SSRIs? How long can you stay on hormones? These are questions that we need to be asking, doctors need to be thinking about. We, we need to have a kind of robust, holistic discussion about all of these things because most of what people are taking has not been tested on women. You just made me think of something Dr. Ridgway said to me. I think it was you who said that, that even in mice studies, yeah. there are not always female mice being studied. Historically, correct. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that has been a major problem in science. And, and it is what... I didn't know. Did you guys know well, that? I, I didn't know it that. Is, it is what, in 2016, um, it, Elizabeth Warren, uh, my senator, uh, led, um, the, uh, uh, led a large study of looking at the NIH and whether they had really lived up to the, the, um, what the law in 1993 really was supposed to do. And what they found was that to some degree they did, but there were many, many gaps. And these are some of the gaps in animal studies using male animals. Why? Because of course it's easier to use animals that don't have estrous cycles, right? You don't have to control for that, but guess what? We do have estrous cycles. <laughs> and um, female cells in cellular research, in attention to the fact that you really need to be thinking about cells. And there are some very good data that some of the reasons why stem cell research has not been uh, the panacea that we thought it would be is because the way that we do stem cell research is really not specific enough. And one of those areas of specificity is that cells tend to be combined in terms of whether they're male or female. So lots of work to be done, but at least in 2016, with thinking about sex as a biologic variable at the NIH, and that has had ramifications, um, we should be seeing a change. The question is, how do we keep the pressure on to say this is an ongoing concern. We want to see that the follow-up in six, seven, eight years, it's already six years, um, and that's our job um, as we move forward. I I'm mindful of the time, so I wanted to mention to the room that we can take some of your questions if, uh, if people have questions. Is there a microphone or do we just have people shout out? I'm not sure. There is a microphone? There's a microphone. Nice. Okay, so there's a microphone. So we'll keep talking. If anybody wants to raise their hand, maybe we can get the mic to a, a first question. I think question. the other thing oh. maybe to say to your daughter, and my daughter's a little bit And I don't mean just my daughter. No, I, I know. All I know. of our daughters. I, I'm talking about this holistically always, but is to believe yourself. Believe what you are feeling mm. uh, mentally, cognitively, yes. emotionally, or spiritually, and to understand that just because you're the person sitting next to you uh, is doing X, Y, and Z, and X, Y, and Z has worked for the person next to you, you're your own machine, you're your own engine. And what you eat may work differently, what you're taking is different, and your symptoms, particularly when we talk about menopause and even pregnancy, the pendulum is like this. Some people sail right through it, no problem. Some can't get out of bed. Some feel suicidal just in pregnancy. Some flourish. Some are in bed, some have depression afterwards, right. some have anxiety, that we're all different. And to begin at a very young age, to trust yourself, to trust the symptoms, to trust that you know your body. And that will help you as you get to your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, and beyond. And, and communicate that to your doctor yeah. and not undersell your own symptoms or cut yourself off by saying, well, I'm not sure, I'm, I, I think it's fine, don't worry. Say, I mean, this how is, many times this is happening? Said, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm fine, I'm fine. Yeah. 
Right. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, so exactly. don't discount that. Don't discount and that. And speak up. And speak up. Um, I know we have some questions, so I want to get to you guys. Um, who's got the microphone? Okay. Go ahead, sir. Oh, yeah. Right there. Hi. Um, so I uh, greatly enjoyed the discussion. So I'm an NIH-funded researcher who studies osteoporosis, Alzheimer's, and diabetes, and links between all these three. So the discussion is, is, is very relevant. And have benefited from um, you know, inclusion of sex as biological variable. And there are clearly sex-related differences in, in my model. I study preclinical models. But one experience I wanted to share that these studies are all funded by NIH now, but it was a struggle to see which institute they belong to, because arthritis and musculoskeletal research, aging and diabetes are three institutes. And everybody said it falls between them, not within their mandate. So I'm wondering with the discussion today that is it time for this group and for us to look at that there's NIH should establish a Women's Health Institute, which is going to specifically study these aspects. Yeah. I wonder if you want to comment on that. So this is a good question. There actually is an Office for Research in Women's Health at NIH. Um, inaugural uh, director was my dear friend and mentor, Vivian Penn. I had actually served on their advisory board for a number of years, and now it's Dr. Janine Clayton. There um, has been, over time, a real movement to get that uh, center, that office, to actually become an institute, which it would lie at the intersections of all of the other institutes. That has never, we have never been able to make that happen. Um, they did create an institute of minority health and not for women's health. And, and the two should not be in competition, by the way, because they intersect. Um, funding has, over the years, decreased. So that is another place where voices have not been strong enough to say that this is critical to move forward. Um, so I, I totally I couldn't agree with you more. Thank you for that. We'll go to another question. I, sorry, I can't tell. You have the mic, and so you have to. Just okay, there's here. two mics. Okay, so right there. Thank you so much for this great panel. Um, so do the doctors have formal training in menopause or perimenopause? And is there a place where they get trained as a consumer? How do I know my doctor has gotten any training? Yeah, so in obstetrics and gynecology, there is formal training in menopause medicine. Um, probably not enough. And at the time the training takes place in residency, right? These are younger women, usually in their late 20s, early 30s. And how practices typically work in bigger cities is that you start out with a OB heavy practice. So by the time your patient population ages with you, the uh, training in, in menopause that took place is, a, is rather obsolete. And so um, that is an area of um, in real importance that we continue training, encouraging this, discussing how in a woman's life this is a critical time period, and also connecting with primary care docs who can do that. There are fellowships in uh, specialized women's health. And these are family medicine, internal medicine doctors who do extra years and are true experts in this transition. There is I, a North American Menopause yes. Society where you can find and they list doctors that might be in your area. But so many women I've spoken to say even the perimenopause period that could begin in their 40s, which is often kind of, I would call a critical juncture point where you're finding like my, you might have teenagers, you might have aging parents, you might be in a really stressful job. And so many of the symptoms that you might be feeling, you think is a life thing, or you think like, oh my God, I got to keep it all together. And maybe it's because I have a sick mother or a sick father, or my kid is you know, going through teenage years, but it's actually perimenopause. So even just understanding that you are beginning a new journey and one that you can come out of and feel better than ever, but that it's really important, I think, to stress you're not crazy, you're not wacko, mm. uh, you know, this is a physiological change and that there is help there for you. And I think that that's a really important thing for women to know, that you can look up and find doctors who are kind of 
in this society and also begin to even ask your doctor if you don't know a lot about menopause or you don't know a lot about hormones, is there someone you could direct me to that might be able to help me? And then speaking of like at NIH, there's been such a kind of a desire to pick up the Women's Health Initiative that left millions of women kind of in the dark about hormones. Yeah. So there's so much misinformation and miscommunication about that. And you know, then NIH, and I've gone and talked to them several times, they're like, it's too expensive to start another women's health initiative. So we need a women's health movement, right, at NIH and beyond when it comes to funding and launching yeah. these large yeah. scale studies. Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to add, I mean, it's a really important question about what is training in medical school. So we're here talking about menopause and perimenopause, but what is missing in medical school education is quite frankly, in every area of learning, there should be a discussion of sex differences. There needs to be a discussion around sex differences, the social determinants of health, and how we think about disease as it impacts um, these factors, as it impacts disease. And that can't be one lecture or two lectures, which, which is really what it tends to be more broadly when you get past the OBGYN. So we must do better. Um, there was a period of time where we were beginning to see a bit more integration into some of the standards that we have to achieve in medical school education, but we still have an enormous way to go because there are things that we can learn there are areas where we have made advancement, but they're not necessarily communicated or taught at the level of medical school and then in residency training. Let's get a couple more if we can. We've only got a few more minutes. Um, back on this side of the room. Put your hands up for me. Okay, maybe in the middle there. We'll do, yeah, so the woman in the back, and then we'll go to the woman in front in pink. Okay. Thank you for this conversation. I'm a family physician in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I would love to be able to help each of my patients reach abundant health. But there just say that hold the yeah, mic right. up a little closer. I would love to help each of my patients reach abundant health. I'm a family physician in Tulsa, Oklahoma. But there are a couple of references made to the 15-minute visit. Yeah. In my clinic, I will see my average patient 2.3 times per year. That's 35 minutes per year that I have with them to have a conversation in which I can find out the ecosystem in which they live and what they need to reach their goals. So I want to know what kind of push is there to create a system in which I have the time to have these extended conversations with my patients. Do you want to, do you want to take that? Yeah. We have to change our system. This is not sustainable for doctors for other providers, and it certainly is not in the best interest of the patient. The constraints that we have on time and also in how our payers value the work we do is um, really puts us in a position where we are seeing patients twice a year for 15 minutes each Sorry, time. does payers mean insurance companies? Yes, okay. thank you. <laughs> I'm more blunt. <laughs> yeah. It also, um, we have to change our model because there are many other people who can coach, who can educate, who can work in, be outside of that doctor's office to provide the preventative care that's necessary that the primary care physicians and beyond don't have the time and really we don't have enough of them. One thing we've talked about a lot in this panel is just the coordinating, the there are many, many places in the U.S. that don't even have a physician in that county or in that city. And so I want to recognize just the privilege we're talking about in this and that in many places they have one doctor or they'll have to drive to a different county. Can I just and also when you talk about getting billing, you know, you don't get reimbursed for prevention, right? And so that's a whole other thing. So if you spend time on prevention, you, that's mm -hmm. very you poorly paid, reimbursed. Yeah. Yes. Very poor. um, can, I, I, you can go. I just, I'm I conscious know we have, that we're over our time, and there's one more person who wanted to ask I just a do. I mean, I think this is a critically important issue. And the other thing that we really do, and I think we saw this up close and personal in COVID. In COVID, you can do the one by each, but if you do not have a strong public health system that is connected with your healthcare delivery system, we are going to lose. And I think this is a moment 
where we have to think about strengthening our public health system and then connecting that with our health care delivery system. People are not just individuals that are owned by a system. They are part of neighborhoods. They're part of an environment. If we don't connect the two, we will not really advance health and well-being really for anybody. Thank you for adding that. Um, one last question here in the middle. All right. This maybe tie into some of this that you're discussing about. Um, Hold it uh, nice and uh, close. Yeah. Okay. I'm thinking about a health care coordinator, um, quarterback kind of person. I think it's unreasonable that the average American can do this for themselves when a lot of people don't even want to take a vaccine or think it's a chip in the vaccine. So is there any, any discussion about providing that for people like a nurse, someone who would be a, quarter, a quarterback or a coordinator. I think in Europe, maybe they provide that. Like a patient a coordinator, picture. a medical coordinator? Yes, yeah, someone who can do maybe what I do for my family and you all do for your families. I have a hard time hearing. Um, I think she's saying, is there a way to have an outsider help you with that quarterbacking? You know, is there a... Absolutely. If you can't advocate for yourself uh, for whatever variety of reasons, you need someone to partner with you to do that. And it doesn't have to be a doctor. Um, there are many people who have the capabilities to provide that service. Um, but this gets, again, connecting, as Dr. Uh, President Johnson said, to the community and how we care holistically. And it's expensive to yeah, hire someone yeah, to do that. That's expensive. the problem. There, there, there are there are some models, models. though. Yeah, there are yeah. there are models that are out yeah. there that have been uh, studied, and there are some places that actually do have that model built in. Um, and another place where you see this are insurance companies are more and more yeah. offering that kind of coordination. Very different, but I think there's a recognition that there needs to be much better coordination. Thank you all so much. I feel like we Thank could you. stay for hours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.